Well, we're continuing our series today called Transformed. And in this series, we're basing it on this verse that you just saw on the screen that I'm going to put up again. that says, do not copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Now, this is key to the series because it's God that does the transforming work in us, not us. We can't transform ourselves. We can be a little more disciplined, maybe, if we're a disciplined person, and we can try harder, and we can get enthusiastic about changing our lives, but only God can work real change within us. And it's Him that is doing it. So it's God who's transforming you, and look how He does it. He does it by changing the way you think. Not your behavior, because that comes afterwards. God has to change the way we think. And then the beautiful thing is, is that once we begin to think like God about our lives, then we know God's will for us. And it's good, and it's pleasing, and it's perfect. Those are good descriptors of your life. And you can have those if God can do the transforming work in you that He wants to. And in this series, when we talk about what God wants to transform, is our thinking primarily about Him and about our own lives. And what we're doing is we're exploring two realms in this series. We're exploring what the Bible has to say about transformation, but we're also exploring what neuroscience and teachings that we have about the brain and how that affects our connection with God and all of our relationships. So I'm going to do a quick review from last week. Let's see uh, how well you last, lessened last week before we put these up. Uh, what, when a child is born, what's the number one thing that they feed on? Joy, good. That's according to Dr. Alan Short, UCLA, one of the leading researchers in neuroscience. And he relates joy to relational happiness. In other words, knowing that someone is glad to see me, that I'm valuable to somebody. This is the most important thing that a child can get. Unconditional love. Knowing that their parents value them. We also talked about how trauma happens in our life. Remember we talked about two types of trauma. What are they? A and B. You guys are amazing. What is A trauma? Absent. Yeah, what things were absent in our lives. Things that we should have got and didn't. And then B trauma is what? Bad. Bad things that happen to us. So things that happen in our lives. Which is harder to fix? A trauma. Neglect creates more trauma in your life than abuse. A child is more affected by neglect than they are by abuse. Because with abuse, abuse, they still have that anchor. Someone still loves them. A child that doesn't know that they are loved has no place in their life to anchor to. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. Why do we know this is true? We bring neuroscience into this. Now, through CT scans, PET scans, MRIs, MRAs, EEGs, we can really know what's happening inside of a brain. Let's put this next slide up. This is a healthy brain on the left, an uh, an abused brain on the right. Not the brain physically abused, but someone who is emotionally abused. And you can see large areas in the prefrontal cortex there that are just not working. Okay, There's not the connections, the synapse aren't connecting, there's not a neural pathway so that when we're in a crisis, our brain automatically goes to a place of peace and connection with God. And that's why all of this is important and why I'm bringing it in. Because if our connections are not healthy when we're young, your brain sees God as another attachment in life. And if your attachments aren't good early in your life, you will have difficulty connecting with God as well. Because He's another authority figure. doesn't mean you can't. I've seen God plow through and heal people of the worst trauma the, the greatest amount of neglect in their life. But for the most part, people without good connections early on in life will wrestle in connecting with God and really trusting Him. Now, 
The scary thing last week we looked at was Shore and his research at UCLA discovered that personality and the ability to bond throughout life are set in place by age three, maybe sooner. You say, well, it's too late then. How am I going to go back and fix something that happened to me before I was three years old? You can. We can help you with that. This bond with our parents early on or significant caregivers on our life is critical. We call this bond attachment. And we're going to talk about attachment today and why it's so important. And we're going to see where the Bible and science meet to present some amazing truth to us. Because our brain sees God as another attachment, it always ties it back to what kind of ability to attach we had in our early life. Now, the Bible uses this language, which is really interesting. If you look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, and it talked about Adam and Eve, and it says, For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they become one flesh. One. Connected. That word there, join, is a Hebrew word, debach, which means to be glued together, or attached, to cling, to cleave, to stick to. It's used 52 times in the Bible. These attachments are something that God designed for us to have at the very beginning, before the fall, before anything else. God wants us to be connected to Him and to one another. This is His design. Psalm 63, David said, My soul clings. It attaches to you. And then your right hand upholds me. David knew that God would take care of him, that whatever he went through, God would uphold him and protect him and guard his life. Why? Because my soul clings to you. Now, that's not a desperate kind of clinging like we think of sometimes. Somebody's clinging or, or we're trying to always grasp at God. That's from an insecure attachment. And so we never feel like we're in the right place with God. But what David was describing was such a strong, secure attachment that he always went back to that. He always knew that God loved him. And therefore, he could say with confidence, look, regardless of what I go through, I know that your right hand is going to uphold me. So you can have peace in the middle of whatever storm you're going through in life. Now, I want us to real quickly look at how we develop as human beings. And this goes back to the work of Eric Erickson. If you had Psych 101, you probably talked a little bit about Erickson and the eight levels of social cycle development. And the reason why I want to look at this, and we're going to fly through it pretty quick. So um, if you have version, it's all in there. You can just, it's all download. There's a bunch of extra stuff in version this week, by the way, too. So you should get that. And I will be posting my notes each week at TonyPortel.com, so you can go there and um, if you want to review anything or look at it. Um, Erickson was quite an individual. I mean, his work was back in the 1950s. He's the only person to ever be a professor at Yale and Harvard and never have a degree. He never even had an undergraduate degree and taught at Yale and Harvard. He invented the term identity crisis. He coined that. And he came up with this, and we'll put this up. He looked at each stage of our life, eight stages, and what was really important to us and what we needed to get out of each stage. And here's why this is important. As we go through these real quick, you're going to see areas that maybe you connected well and areas that you didn't. When you can start to isolate those and begin to see back to times in your life that maybe attachments weren't secure or trauma happened in your life, it's easier to go back and to for God to heal those areas of your life. So it starts out over here on the left, yeah, your left, with our mother. And that's the first attachment and most important one in our life. Everything else is based on that. And it's the infant is, tr is wrestling with trust or mistrust. Can I trust you? Can I trust you to feed me? Can I trust you to care for me, to protect me? And that's what inside we're asking, even though our brain isn't able to process that, that's what we're really wanting to know. The next level is 
can I begin to trust myself? Now mom and dad are both involved, and, and you're going through autonomy. You're starting to move off on your own. Am I safe being over here when mom and dad are over there? Can I handle this crisis of potty training? You know, am I going to be uh, shamed, uh, or am I going to succeed here? And, and that has a lot to do with child's development into adulthood. Preschool. Now the father becomes really important, because by this time, you're pretty secure in mom's love, but dad's, you want his approval. And so it's really important at this point in a child's development that they get dad's approval. And they're really wanting that objective. They feel like dad, mom's a little subjective. She just loves us regardless. But dad seems like a little more objective, a little harder to convince. You know? And so what they're wanting to know is, am I valuable? And then they get to school age, and they begin to value their friends and their friends' opinions. And they want to know, you know, Am, am, I, am I really significant? Do I have a place here? When you get picked last for dodgeball, ah, oh, what does that do to your self-esteem? When you're not the fastest or the smartest in class, how does that make you feel? How do you handle that? Then into adolescence, it starts with the opposite sex. And they're asking, am I attractive? Am I appealing to someone else? This is different than just being in friends. Now, this is a different level. And then you get into adulthood and, and uh, intimacy versus isolation. Am I capable to be in a relationship? Do I have what it takes to be in a relationship? Can, can I have that back and forth? Can I find a mate? And then you move into adulthood. And adulthood starts technically with when you have your first child. So if you're 30 and haven't had kids yet, you still get to be a child. But this is when officially adulthood begins. And the question there is, can I show unconditional love to another human being? And then you get into my age, which is maturity, and you start to look back on life, and you ask the question, how did I do? And if you feel like you did well, you'll end your days well. If you feel like life didn't go so good, you become that grumpy old man that yells at you because you got on his lawn. You know, And you don't want to be that guy or that woman. So, at each of these things, what's most significant, I believe, in each of these areas are the questions we ask. And a lot of people, they don't ask these questions. They're, they're always floating around in our head, but here's the thing. If you don't answer the questions, they just pile up in your brain. And what happens is, when you don't resolve each of these questions, you get adults that are very immature. And you can see it. They have you, in them, you see the inability to regulate their emotions. They can't calm down. You know, everybody gets upset, but these people just can't calm down. They act childish, we say. They have inconsistent behavior. You can't count on them. They can't seem to order their life right. They wrestle a lot of times with addictions. Uh, they have fear-based guidance in their life. Everything they do, they live these guarded lives. They're risk-averse because they don't have the confidence that they can succeed or that they'll come out okay. And they have low satisfaction. They're just not happy. Sometimes too serious, too cautious, and so on. All of these things go back to early attachment. Now, let me just say, there are a lot of opportunities on that circle for trauma to happen in your life to be rejected by somebody, to go through some crisis, whatever it might be, there's a lot of opportunity. But the stronger the attachments in that first portion, the easier it is to work through trauma the rest of your life. That's why this is so important. David says this in Psalm 22. Yes, you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. What a powerful statement that is. Think about that. David says, while he was in this most intimate place of being nursed by his mother, of her giving life to him, think of the intimacy and the power of that attachment. And you mothers know what I'm talking about. David said, it's at those moments that I was not only learning to attach emotionally to my mom, but I was also learning 
the foundation would, was being laid on how I would later attach to God. See, when you study the Bible, when you study science, thankfully science is catching up with this. You know, David only wrote this about 3,000 years ago. He, he knew something about attachment that, you know, thankfully we're learning today. The Bible says of Jesus in Luke 2.52, And Jesus grew, and so did his wisdom and maturity. The favor of man increased on his life for why he was loved greatly by God. See, Jesus knew who he was on the night of the Last Supper. John says in John 13 that Jesus, knowing who he was, where he had come from, and where he was going, put an apron around and began to serve the disciples. It was his security in God's love that he could humble himself to serve somebody else, who at the time certainly didn't deserve to be served. But because Jesus knew who he was, because the Father loved him greatly. So, Let's talk a little bit about attachment and how this attachment happens early. And if it doesn't, what's the outcome? So we're going to look at four different types of attachment. And this is work going back to John Bowlby in the 50s and um, uh, Mary Ainsworth in the 70s and then other people. This was just, uh, this whole study was revisited back in 85 and revised again and so on. And what they did was they took children and put them in a room with a mom. This is the, how, they, how they determined how well the attachment was. So they set the baby down in the room, and there's some toys there. The mom sits on the other side of the room. And the baby's playing with the toys. And then mom gets up and leaves the room. And these are 12-month, 18-month-old babies. <laughs> They're still baby at that age. And just to see what the reaction would be, in the baby when the mother came back into the room. If the baby cried, which all of them, mostly, mostly all of them did, a secure child would come over, hug its mother, the mother would calm it down, and that's another thing that happens early in life is when your parents help you regulate your emotions, you then in turn learn how to regulate your own later in life or throughout life. So the mother would comfort the child, and after a few minutes, it would go back and play because everything was good. Mom was gone. She's back. I trust her. I'm going to go back and play. Other kids would come back. When the mom would come back in the room, they'd begin to cry, and then they'd never leave mom because she left me, and I don't know if she's going to leave again, so I am not letting her get away. And then other kids would would come in and actually kind of be mad at mom. They'd be comforted, but also be mad because she had left them. And then there was a final group of kids that when the mother left the room, the child didn't even notice. And when the mother came back in, the child didn't notice. Those are the scary ones. Because this is a child that never received love. They've been neglected. A trauma. And as a result, at this age, they don't expect someone to be there for them. So who cares who comes in and out? The toy is the most important thing at the moment. Now, it's only about 2% of our population today. But these people really have difficulties in life. So I thought an easier way to show you this was to lean on characters that you may have seen. Okay, So we have a secure attachment and three insecure attachments. The first one is called anxious ambivalent. And this is best seen in Anakin Skywalker. Any Star Wars fans? Okay, some. If you're not, hang on. <laughs> I'm going to go through this quick. But Anakin Skywalker shows that ambivalent anxiety. The one who's mad at the mother for, for leaving, this was his life. He grew up this way. He was raised as a slave on Tatooine, if you know about that. And, uh, and he he's, uh, leaves his mother early on in life. And then he becomes assessed. Remember uh, Padaway, who he 
falls in love with, he's obsessed with her. And these people tend to be obsessed in relationships. He, he says at one point, I can't breathe when you're not around. I need you so much. And they tend to cling very hard out of fear of a broken connection. And they live this way. You may know people like that. That, that they just they are checking up on their spouse all the time. Or they're, they're in a relationship. They're always jealous. And they also always feel like that they're not worthy of the relationship and the person's going to leave them anyway. Then, we'll switch over to marble here a little bit. You have the anxious avoidant. Now, Tony Stark, Iron Man, he's the opposite of Anakin. Where Anakin fears the loss of connection, Tony Stark is completely afraid of a deep connection. If you watch him throughout the movies, anytime there's an opportunity to be tender and gentle, he always makes a joke. And that's one thing that people in this area do. They so fear intimacy, they'll never look you in the eye. And when things get too tough, they, they veer away or they crack a joke, and they use humor to defer any situation that may get too emotional. And then you have the anxious, what's called the anxious disorganized. This is those 2 or 3% of the people in the world who received no love growing up. Nebula from Guardians of the Galaxy or Marvel uh, fits this. She was literally taken apart by her father and criticized and pitted against her sister her entire life. So her life is all about getting even, getting revenge, coming out on top, protecting herself, putting up walls so that no one can get in. These people are the hardest people to reach with God's love because they have no reference point to somebody being good and loving them especially unconditionally. Another figure that we see, anxious, disorganized, how many have seen the movie Good Will Hunting? Great movie, especially if you're a psych student, you know? Because Will, who Matt Damon plays in the movie, is someone who's abused as a child growing up. He talks about that in the movie. And so what he has is such disorganized attachments that when Skylar, the girl that he meets, really loves him and wants a relationship with him, he fights it. He resists her. He says, there's no way you could love me. And when every psychologist that they try to send him to, he just rejects every one of them and turns them around and puts them in shame because he's just so brilliant, but he doesn't believe that he can be loved. And then you get to that incredible scene where Robin Williams looks at him and he says, it's not your fault. And he says it over and over, and he says, don't mess with me, because he's starting to open up to him, and he says, it's not your fault. And I didn't understand there for a long time, what did that mean? It's not your fault. It's not your fault. What he's saying is, it's not your fault that nobody loved you. It's not your fault that you're so defensive because nobody ever showed you the kind of love that you needed. And for him, that was a breakthrough moment because he was able to accept the unconditional love of Robin Williams in the movie. Now you'll want to go out and watch all these, won't you? And then, here's our example of a secure attachment. Captain America. He's a leader. He gets along good with everybody. When he does have the conflict with Iron Man, he's the first to repent. He's secure. He's level-headed in a crisis. You watch him in all the movies. He's very calm for the most part. And he becomes our model of a secure attachment. We don't know much about his childhood, but he was raised in the 30s. So that means he probably had a better attachment you know, Alan Shore said recently, I was watching a lecture of him a couple weeks ago, and he said that 20 years ago, 55 per, or, uh, 75% of people in the U.S., they project have secure attachments. 20 years ago. Today, 20 years later, 55%. Think about that. Almost half the people in America don't know that they are loved by somebody. Remember I shared last week how 39% of people in America feel like they have no friends. And you start to see where these things come together. Now, for some people, you hear this and go, Tony, this is just a bunch of psychobabble. 
and uh, stick to the Bible. You know, we don't need all this stuff. How accurate is it anyway? Well, pretty accurate. Um, a few years ago, actually 18 years ago, they did a study. And they studied three-year-olds. And in these three-year-olds' lives, the researchers were able to determine what kind of attachment they had, whether it was good and secure or a bad attachment. They were able to project into the future how these kids would turn out. In fact, they projected which ones would drop out of high school. This study was done by the University of Minnesota. I think it was called the Conceptualize the Role of Early Experience. What's amazing is this past year they just completed the study. Now it's 15 years later and these kids are 18 years old. How accurate were they at three years old estimating their success at age 18? Look at this. 77%. Now think about that for a minute. To be able to look at a three-year-old and to know with 77, almost 8 out of 10 accuracy, which ones are going to succeed in life and which are not going to. This is why this stuff matters and why it impacts our life. Now, I've got really good news. The rest of this is really good news. I know for some people, you watch this, you listen to this, and whether you're at home or here today, if you're a parent, you go, fault? Is it my fault? How good did I do? Did I do a bad job with my kids? Am I doing a bad job with my kids? Let me just encourage you, first of all. Kids are very pliable. <laughs> and their brains can still be shaped into early adulthood. So what you didn't give kids when they were small, you can give them now. You can give them what they need. You can help that attachment. You can actually create a secure attachment with your kids or with the significant people in your lives. Some of you, your marriage is not a secure attachment. And that needs to be strengthened. But it can. All the pains, all the wounds can be reversed by God and a good dose of unconditional love. That's what your kids need. I tell parents all the time, you can offer your child something nobody else in the world can. Unconditional parental love. Never give that up. Well, we're going to try tough love. Well, here's what I see in tough love. And I'm for boundaries and stuff like that. But a lot of times tough love is just your own frustration. And your life is being put out of order. And you're frustrated with this child, especially when you see them reflecting back your own weaknesses. Ooh, that's really tough. And you didn't know how to fix yourself, so how are you going to fix them? You do it by loving them unconditionally. Never close that door to your kids. Always know that they can come to you and they can find that kind of love because that love will guide them to God's love. See, well, how much of this love do I have to show? Enough to convince them that you love them unconditionally. Well, that's a lot of work. I'd rather just be on my smartphone or binge on Netflix. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the route that too many people have taken. And as a result, we've got children suffering, we have adults suffering today, and we need to change this. Now, I would even say, too, if you're a grandparent, you can play a valuable role in the life of your grandkids. They can get that unconditional love and acceptance and attention from you as well. And even if you're an adult and you have adult kids, give them unconditional love. Because someday they're going to decide whether to put you in a nursing home. <laughs> 
And your quality of care may directly relate to how kind you were to them. So be nice. We often say, healed or hurt people hurt people. But it's also true that healed people heal people. And that's why we need to be people that are healed and whole. God says in Psalm 147, He heals the brokenhearted and He binds up their wounds. Again, it's God that does this. And what we can do is help you to be able to approach God. To be able to create a setting whereby that God can bring about the healing that He wants to. Let me finish with this. I love how Paul describes the kind of relationship that God wants us to have with Him in Romans chapter 8. Let's put this up. Actually, let's start verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of religious duty leading you back into fear of never being good enough. In other words, what Paul's saying there in that verse is he says, when you come into a relationship with God, Jesus doesn't put a whole bunch of religious stuff on you that you have to do now to please Him. He loves you unconditionally. And there are things we can do to grow in our faith, to learn more about God through study of His Word and through spiritual disciplines like fasting and solitude and so on. But, those are not requirements to keep us in good standing or to try to impress God. Jesus told us, He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I'm never going to put weight on you to add to the burden of your life. Verse 16, But you have received the Spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God, and you will never feel orphaned. For as He rises up within us, our spirits join Him, saying the words of tender affection, Beloved Father. This was the turning point in my life. 1991, I was serving on staff at a large church in St. Louis, doing well, loved my job, but I just didn't have much of a relationship with Jesus. I'd been 10 years in ministry, seminary, graduate work. I could tell you all day about the love of God. I could define it for you. I could trace it throughout. I could give it to you in the original languages and everything else. I had it all, going back to last week, in my head, or more specifically, left brain. But it had never got down to here. It had never crossed over to the relational side of my brain. So I knew a lot and could teach others. It was crazy as I could help others experience the love of God. I just had never experienced it myself at, at the level that God wanted me to. I felt like a fraud, a hypocrite. So I just resigned from the church April 4th, 1991. One of the best days and worst days in my life. For the next three weeks, I just went home and cried, <laughs> prayed. To know God. To know Him for real. To lay down the facades and and everything that I put up to try to impress other people or come across in a certain way. Just to figure out who I was and who God was to me. I wish I'd had the tools that we have today to help you. But I didn't. And thank God in His grace... He just loved me. And the real breakthrough came when I could understand and really believe in my core that God was a good Father. Verse 16, Paul says, For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us. That's what God was doing in my life. As he whispers in our innermost being, you are God's beloved 
child. I can stand here today and tell you I am absolutely secure in the fact that I am God's beloved child. I'm God's favorite child. Because He loves me so uniquely and so amazingly. And the incredible thing is, is when you begin to step into this kind of love, it keeps growing in your life. I love more Jesus more today than I did yesterday and the day before. And that used to be just something religious, I said. Every day, remember the old hymn, Every Day with Jesus is Sweeter Than the Day Before? I mean, I sang it, I just didn't believe it. Today I can say that that's true. Every day he reveals himself in new ways to me. I could go through my journal this week and just show you several ways that God showed himself real to me and just gave me new understandings of who he is. I was reading Wednesday and, and, and I was reading where uh, he says, um, you know, my splendor is, is above the heavens and earth, you know. And it's a nice statement. But then I started, he started taking me back to all the places where I'd seen his splendor in this earth. Sitting by the ocean and watching the sun rise over it. Standing on top of a mountain, looking across those vistas. Being in beautiful garden places and places all around the world I've got to travel to. And then I started thinking of my favorite place to see God or contemplate the bigness of God is to lay out under the stars and just see the vastness of space. And I said, God, I've seen your glory, your splendor in the earth and in the heavens. But he says, my splendor is above the earth and the heavens. And I went, wow! I want to see that. And he says, I'm going to show you. I haven't got to see it yet, but I'm anxious to. And I don't think it's something we have to wait for until we die. Paul said he got to visit heaven and see into that realm of God. And he didn't even know if he was alive or dead or what was happening, but he was so, he had this such a deep, rich encounter with God. See, this is what God wants for us. This kind of just add religion to our life as another piece of baggage we have to carry, as a little booster rocket to our own plans, as a life where we say that we love God, but we don't live that way. The good news I can tell you today is, it's not your fault. For many of you, you haven't been able to have the kind of relationship with God that you've wanted to, that you hear other people talk about, And it's because of bad connections, attachments in your life, and trauma that's happened throughout your life. And like I said, God wants to heal that. And if you'll open your life to Him and let us help you, you can find healing from whatever you've gone through and experience God in a fresh, new way and have the life He intended for you. Do you want that? We can help you with it. In the weeks ahead, we're going to show you, we're going to start next week and talk about how you can live in a place where regardless of what's going around you, you never lose that sense of joy or peace. And you'll experience that next week. But until then, if there's stuff going on in your life and you just say, you know, I need help in this area. Myself, Tana, we've got some other people that are happy to pray with you and help you find that breakthrough. So take advantage of that. Let's pray.